Bayan, Bonnie Banks, and Bayan, Bonnie Blen, where the sun shines bright. Oh, it's not a singing engagement, sorry. <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> I am here to talk about cars as much as I would love to sing. Okay, Local Motors is a new American car company which could be a new global car company depending upon if we execute what we said we were going to do. And I have a couple of things that I'd like to talk about. Some of them are part of what I normally talk about with Local Motors and the others are just, as we've all been asked to do, dig a little bit deeper into sort of where the story came from and where we came up with how to execute it. So um, I'll try to touch on those items as we go along. Uh, this is what we know today of the automotive industry as given to us by Henry Ford um, and many other automotive entrepreneurs, but he sort of put it together perhaps in a more concrete way than anyone else. Diego Rivera made this famous in the sort of mass industrialized economy of scale. And it is the only paradigm that I think many of us think of when we think of the car industry. If I ask probably anybody, well, first of all, how many people have driven a car in this room? Come on, let's have the hands. It's pretty much almost everybody. On this. You're too young to drive a car. <laughs> and so, uh, so the bottom line is we all, we all have driven a car, and many of us, whether we like it or not, have expounded on our beliefs of what's screwed up about the car industry and how it should be fixed. We're all automotive entrepreneurs. I've found this since I started a car company that it's been fascinating for me to watch how many people have opinions on the business that I'm starting. I have no opinions on how to start an environmental fisheries well-subsidized business, which my friend Alistair is going to talk about. I have no idea how to start a self-help business about teaching how to organize your life better, and I haven't really thought that much about it. But in cars, I've definitely found this to be the case. So what I share, no doubt, will resonate with some and be hostile to others. So uh, um, this is today the Nissan Smyrna plant in Smyrna, Tennessee. It is hailed as one of the most advanced factories that there is. It's several million square feet, and it cost two and a half billion dollars. It brought huge subsidies to the state of Tennessee, and it is supposed to make the most flexible line of cars out there. This was Detroit. <coughs> which looked like Smyrna, Tennessee, and now in Bellevue Avenue, it looks like this, because it turned out that they couldn't make cars flexibly, and they couldn't deliver what customers wanted. They couldn't keep pace with innovation, and now you have pushing 30% unemployment in Flint, Michigan. 30%. One out of every three people is heading into poverty. That is something that is deeply shocking in a country like the United States. This was me before I started Local Motors, and I want to tell you a little bit about how I got there right here. So here goes. My grandfather owned a motorcycle company called the Indian Motorcycle Company back in the 1940s. He bought it shortly before the war was over because he was an automotive entrepreneur. He had started a diesel engine company called the Rogers Diesel and Aircraft Company. And he had made his first million dollars by the time he was 35 years old. And his goal, his vision, his, uh, well, first his goal and then his vision was to be able to, if that's the right order, was to be able to, uh, um, to start a major car company or a major motorcycle company. And he did it with Indian. And it failed within the first 12 years. He worked very hard at it. And he learned a lot of lessons. It was perhaps one of his most favorite things. And then he went on to found the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which brought us shows like Sesame Street and American Public Television. That was his greatest legacy, but perhaps his greatest love was the automotive industry. And there were 17 of us grandchildren, and nobody followed in his footsteps in the automotive industry. But I have about six cousins that are involved in public television. So I thought, well, I have to go this way since Big Bird has been sopped up by my older cousins. I'm the youngest of the 17. And so I decided I was going to go down that road. But I couldn't quite figure out where and when to do that. I was going to Princeton University in New Jersey, great school, highly recommend it to anybody who wants to try. And uh, I was going to be a mechanical aero engineer. And I was going to build cars for a living. And I went off. I, they make you write an application that t explains your life away and why you're going to be the next best engineer. So I did it all dutifully. And I showed up. And the first thing my advisor said to me was, just let me know if you're going to commit suicide. His name was Enoch Durbin. 
And I said to myself, what is that at all does that have to do with making cars? And then over the course of two years, I proceeded to get more and more disenfranchised from the engineering curriculum at Princeton. Plasma physics, electrical engineering, computer science, those were all great. This was the home of Albert Einstein. But if you want to build cars, you are in the backwater of what we want to do. And by the end of two years, they had me crying at my desk every time I went into the lab because I was so unhappy. And I called my parents and I said, I want to leave school because this isn't what I wanted to do. This isn't why I came. And they convinced me, instead of leaving school, to just drop engineering and let go of that and do something else. So I became an art history major. And uh, um, does that sound familiar to anyone? And I thought the cars were dead for me. I had rebuilt two Porsche 356As by the time I was 15 years old, and I had rebuilt a Volvo. I had knew the chapter and verse of almost every car out there, and I was just a devotee of the automotive industry and of my grandfather, and they had crushed my dream by the time I was 19 years old. So art history went forward, and I came to the end of my senior year, and a friend of mine said, why don't you join the Marine Corps? And here I was about to do it again. And I said, okay. And so I went out to do it. And uh, the bottom line was I broke my leg very badly in training and I couldn't do it. And so now I had sort of seen a bunch of different ambitions sort of change and go by the wayside. And I had been speaking Chinese. So I went to China and uh, um, I uh, stayed there for three years in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and a bunch of other small towns in Harbin and other things like that, trying to get an, a, 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 a medical device business off the ground, selling diabetic medical testing products. I'm not diabetic, but I believe very much in the cause and especially in the epidemic proportions in China. And so the business went fairly well and we sold it and I didn't have a position in the job and so I came back to the United States trying to figure out what I was gonna do again. And uh, um, I sort of wended my way around the financial analyst roles um, of a small private equity firm that was buying banks and I was deeply bored and dissatisfied. And so uh, along came an investor in that business and he said, young man, what do you wanna do with your life? And I said, I, sir, I have no idea. I'm really confused. But I did always want to join the service and I wanted to build cars. And he said, well, I don't know anything about building cars. But what I do know is that if you want to join the service, you should do it. And I said, I've broken my leg really badly and that sort of thing. And he said, well, um, I think you could do it. You look very fit to me. I think you could go about it. So how about I send a recruiter to your door? And I said, well, I work for you. I work in your fund. And he said, well, that doesn't matter to me. I think you should go and, uh, and do this. And I said, well, I've been accepted to business school that you're sending me to. <laughs> And he said, I didn't know about that, but he said, I, I do think you should still join the service. You can go to business school at any time you want. And I said, okay, well, I didn't believe he'd do it. And the next day, dress blues, a Marine steps in front of me at the door and says, I'd like to take you to lunch. And so I went to lunch with him. And by the end of the summer, I was in the US Marines. And I spent nine years, that was in uh, 1999 and uh, 1998. And I spent nine years in the Corps as an infantry officer, serving in multiple theaters and leading some of the best men and women I've ever met in my life. It was the most satisfying thing I've ever done. And close to the end of my time in the Marine Corps, um, I spent nine years total, I spent seven years on active duty. And uh, close to my time on the end of active duty, um, uh, I, two of my friends were, ki were killed in Iraq. And uh, um, one of them uh, had a family that he left behind, another one had a, a wife, no kids, that he left behind. Both fantastic, fantastic soldiers, Marines. And uh, I thought to myself, okay, it's time to execute on plan number two. Because I had done what plan number one was had in store for me, and plan number two had yet to be accomplished. And we had our first baby, Susanna and I did, his name was John the Third, named after my father and then me. And uh, I just didn't want him to grow up in a world where I hadn't tried really hard. And I didn't want the memories of Brent, uh, who was one of my friends that was killed, and uh, Train, who was another one of my friends that had been killed, to say that I didn't try my hardest to do something to make their memory uh, have at least the honor that I felt it was due. So I stopped what I did in the Marine Corps, went on to inactive duty, and I tried to go back to the business school that I'd gotten before, and they didn't let me in. So I applied to another one and uh, got into Harvard, and it's a great school, fantastic. Certainly no, uh, um, no uh, love lost there for the other school that didn't let me in. And so I went and I started writing the plan diligently in the first year. And two years later, I raised the money for Local Motors, and three years later on, we are about to produce our first five cars while I'm standing here. So that's sort of the end result of where we are. I have lots of pictures that I can show you, but the most important thing while I have your attention is to share that story. And a little bit more of the backstory, which I think is important because it has to do with my big do is the following. My grandfather had been, as we sort of talked a little bit about, he had been very successful and then he had an abject failure in something that he loved. And then he turned around and he had a success in something that he didn't even know he was gonna be part of, which has had a lasting implication on society at large. 
And then my father came around, and uh, um, he had a huge success in his life. And then he lost all of his money in a business uh, venture. And I mean, when I say all, I mean all. All. Every bit of it. And that was very scary to me as a young man because I was now living it. And uh, I was in college. My sisters and brothers put me through school because my parents couldn't pay the rest of the tuition. And that was an amazing amount of family to come together. So the backdrop of me to join the Marines and, um, uh, and then start a car venture on top of that legacy, I think is the thread of what my big do has to do with it. So I will say it again at the end, but my big do is no matter what befalls you in life, get out and do what you're passionate about. And do it as early as you can, because the more you wait, the more you become tied down by things that, and that if you decide you're gonna do it at 80, do it at 80, but don't wait till you're 81. It's just important that you don't get slowed down by the things that will inevitably get in your way. That's my big do. Small do will come in just a second. So this is the, the usage that we have of oil. And I, want, I know it's hard in the back to see the slides, so I'm just going to interpret a little bit. There's a line on the left, uh, my, my left, your left, sorry. And there are two lines. One is total consumption in the U.S. I use our country as an example. And the lower line is total imports to the U.S. I think probably everyone in this room has a sense of what I'm going to say, so I don't spend a lot of time. But we import a ton of oil. And most of that oil, all of the oil that we use, is used in cars and light trucks. And when I say most, I mean 70%. Not in buildings, not in trains, not in buses. It's used in cars and light trucks. If you have fancy ideas that it's used in heavy over-the-road trucks, it's not. It's in what we use to get around, the things I see out in the parking lot out there. And nobody's doing anything about it. You hear a lot about Toyota, you hear a lot about GM, you hear a lot about other companies, and they're not making the difference that they need to make. You want to talk about a do. You've got to get out there and actually make that change happen because all of us have assumed that the mass economies of scale of building the car industry are what are singularly important to building a new car industry. And it's not. It's a failed concept, and we have to learn how to do it differently, and that's part of what we're doing at Local Motors. So about that. Um, my grandfather in pictures at Indian Motorcycle, he was the first person to put a diesel engine in a passenger car. You see that very car on the left of the screen. It was an Auburn. These are people that have come before me, and I could sort of count on my hand the number of automotive entrepreneurs that I know that have, didn't personally know, I would have loved to have met them, uh, but we've heard the names. Ferry Porsche, Preston Tucker, uh, Howell and Lewis Crosley, some uh, Malcolm uh, um, Bricklin, there are lots of them that have come around, and some still exist in some form today, most of them not. Sadly, Porsche recently succumbed to its longtime friend. And so, uh, um, so yes, crowdsourcing and co-creation. I'm so glad to be able to stand on the shoulders of giants here because you've already been introduced to most of the concepts that I think make our business successful today. But before Local Motors came around, there was no sharing of automotive design at all anywhere in the world. There was in the classroom, but not in a public forum. And it was so backward, so backward, because it was built on a promise that if I drew it, it was what would get me a job. And so why would I share it with you? Because you might take that job that's in such scarce supply. And so nobody shared. And so this whole idea of crowdsourcing, which we saw in the internet come around in Linux and Linus Torvalds, met the graphic design, photography, as we've heard about, and automotive design, and it stopped with this huge dead wall because people said, that's how I earn my living. Don't you dare come and take it from me. And so this notion of crowdsourcing that Jeff Howe wrote a book about and Chris Anderson had pushed along, they got it wrong because they weren't practitioners of it. I started to become a practitioner of it at Local Motors because we started to look outside for great design. And what happened was people started to say, you're stealing my livelihood. And so I said, you know what? Hold the phone. I'm not stealing your livelihood. I'm dedicating my life to put your livelihood on the road. I'm just not going to do what Steve Jobs here. If you, if you did, if you see this, it says designed by Apple in California. Bullshit. It wasn't designed by Apple. This was designed by Jonathan Ivey. And if it wasn't designed by Jonathan Ivey, it was designed by some member of his team or some derivative idea that they took from somebody out there. Okay? Now, it's a successful business. I use Apple products and I like them, and it's one way to go about things, but it's not the way that we chose to do. So I said to our design community, how about we come up with a new word? Because that word is offensive, crowdsourcing. I'm not sourcing something from you. I'm doing what I call um, co-creation. Co-creation is where you and I together bring this product to market, and I leave your name on, the, on it 
in a big, big way. So you get fame for it, you get paid for it. But just because you don't work for me and you don't have a job in my company, you can still have the right to make a car and make it happen. So this is a big diagram, it's an eye chart, but what it basically says, if you look at the difference, is um, this one has all the ideas coming from the outside and coming to the inside and there's nothing that really goes back in the other direction. And this one has sort of a sharing relationship around the idea. And that's basically the so what factor on these two uh, ideas that we put forward. Okay, so then you have these two very maligned terms, co-creation, which we just talked about, <coughs> and the next one, <coughs> which is open source. <coughs> I look at them as a continuum. Uh, open source is more about like when I have, and please, eyes, don't glaze over. I'm not going to start going into the blue screen of death. But open source is me about, about sharing what it is that we develop together in the community and allowing you in, a, in an attribution, share-alike, non-commercial, creative co commons licensing structure for you to actually go out and take it and make it better. And that's what we need. It's what we need in cars today. <clears throat> so we start with co-creating a rally fighter and then we leave the chassis, the body, the drawings of everything that goes on in the interior open for people to increment on them. We are the first company that has put all of our data for the car online free for anyone to download and use. Think about that. Go ask GM for their data. Go ask Toyota and their hybrid car revolution for their data and see what happens. So you do it once and then you do it again and again and again and again and again and before you know it, I think there's an odds on chance that we're gonna revolutionize the automotive world. So this is my pledge to make a difference in the world is to make cool cars. So making cool cars to me is an acronym. I'm really this bad about remembering things, so I use this, but it's kind of cheesy. Sorry. <laughs> Community, open, ownership, and local. And all of it is everything we've just discussed. We have a community with whom we share ideas to develop cars. We have the most open legal construct that's ever been seen in the automotive world, applying it from other places. We have an ownership experience where not only can you contribute to the design of the car, but you must come and build that car with us in our factory, and that's what the local is. The factories are small, low capital facilities that look more like assembly shops, and they're in your hometown, or will be. And so our first one started in Massachusetts, and then our first big one is in Phoenix, Arizona. And I would like to see them in uh, Britain. I would like to see them in many places here. I'd like to see them in China. I would like to see them in Rwanda. I would like to see them all over the world, because what they allow is they allow the local creation of a relevant and meaningful car, and they allow sustainable, end-of-life use of the parts in that car in a way that we don't do today. Today, when, ca when computer cartridges are finished, we can take them, they can be refilled and restocked as a new product on an Office Depot or Home Depot or what have you type shelf. But with cars, they don't die as a uniform, at a uniform rate. There are many parts that you could reuse, and that's what sustainability is about in the automotive world. It's not about the miles per gallon for your car alone. It's about what part of the car can you use. And if we look at the system, the system just chops and burns cars when it's done. If you go talk to the guys who run a waste management facility, they have no idea how to take apart a Pontiac Aztec versus taking apart a Toyota Hilux. They're different. They sure as shit were made by two different engineers that have very different visions about how to put a hind joint together. And one castle nut is not the same as the other. And it's very possible to reuse a lot of the components, but that guy who runs the waste management facility, he would laugh at you if you told him that I'd like to kind of take these parts and make it, make it work for something else. So we provide a credible end of life solution. Okay. And so uh, this is our community. They're in 120 countries. Every light green country is a place where we have over 100 community members. Every dark green country is between one and 100, and the gray ones have yet to join the revolution. We have over 67,000 automotive designs on our site today that are being shared freely by people. And we have over 7,000 contributors that make part of that. And we have many millions of followers on Twitter and Facebook. And it's been a great way to expand the message. This is an example of some of the competitions we run. We write briefs. And they compete for them. And they earn a lot of money. Some of the cars that come out of it, which some people may say look fanciful, but the truth is the world has not dreamed in technicolor as to what's possible in automotive, so we've developed our own lexicon about what a concept car means. This is our first vehicle, the Rally Fighter. That's what it looked like when we started up at the top, and this is what it looks like in reality down at the bottom. They don't look the same, but they have many things that are like amongst them because our community developed them together from an industrial design and engineering perspective to make them work. That's what it looks like in a new wrap designed by a young man in Mexico, Derek Salgado. You'll see his name at the bottom. This was a side vent that was designed by a young man in Switzerland who currently works for one of the largest car companies in the world. 
but he sure did a great design from us and earned a lot of money in the respect of his colleagues. This is the interior designed by a Romanian, Mihai Panatescu, and it's the interior that we're building at Local Motors. You see our engineers working on that interior right now. This is how we move products along. On the, the left column, you'll see the actual product, and on the right, uh, you will see the product on our car. There's so many questions that I would have to answer about how we build cars, so I try not to focus on that too much. Just wanted to show you some pictures of the actual doing. The do-it-yourself revolution is critical to what we do, and I believe in it very strongly because it means that people are buying more than just a car. They're buying into your experience, and we, we obviously, that's a trend I think that many people understand. And this is just a basic comparison. On the left, you see the old model. Lots of time, lots of people, lots of money, huge factories, and we do it very differently, very, much lighter, much faster. <clears throat> this is a map of our customers, and this is a local motors factory. That's what it looks like cost us $250,000 to put together. It's not a lot of money. That's what it looks like on the inside. 400 plants hanging in a vertical garden to make life more pleasurable while you're building a car. <coughs> more pictures of the building are molds. We wrap every car in vinyl and use no paint. And we can talk about what that allows graphic artists to do as sort of freeing their soul, but it's an amazing thing. Just to yesterday, I went back and used the internet, and I saw the first graphic design come in for my car, which is being built right now, my personal car. And I put out a competition for which I've offered a $2,000 prize, and I saw the first returns yesterday when I went over uh, to David's house. And it just made me dream all night about how excited I'm going to be to drive in that car. <laughs> so five times faster and 100 times less capital, and you get this, out in the desert, testing, real rally fighter, 30 miles per gallon, Think about that. One of the safest, strongest cars on the road today. It's real. It's here. It took us about 18 months to do this. And the whole auto industry said we couldn't. But we did. And it's a lot of fun. And that's me 13 and a half feet in the air, jumping 85 feet, and doing it again and again and again and again. <laughs> and again and again and again and again. And again and again and again and again. So. <clears throat> Pretty wild. Anthony Collard, Philip Jerski, Ugo Spagnolo, Yong Min Hong, Mihai Panatescu, all part of the local motors community. My small do, come build a car with us. It's an easy thing to do. Join a friend if they're the one that has the money. But come, it's a $50,000 car. It's our most expensive one to start out with, but it sure is an experience that you'll never forget. And uh, um, I encourage you, we encourage teams to come and do it together. So that's Local Motors. You can find us online. Thank you.